are going to discuss uh, introduction to coherence and uh, stochastic processes. So before we uh, begin, let's uh, have a quick look at what we did in lecture number one. So in lecture number one, the first thing, uh, I mean, we, we, we looked at in detail as to what are the differences between uh, uh, classical and quantum mechanics. And within, within that, we looked at the superposition principle and interference within classical and quantum mechanics and the differences in, in detail. So, so the superposition in classical wave theory that involves division of, uh, uh, division of amplitude. Uh, this division of amplitude uh, invariably involves division of energy and the uh, interference is because of the superposition of those uh, amplitudes. This theory is fundamentally incorrect but definitely it works at high light level but uh, it doesn't work at the level of single photons. So then we need quantum theory. The quantum theory, uh, the main difference is that here we don't have division of amplitude because we don't have real fields. We have wave function and so position involves a division of wave function and this division of wave function does not invo involve division of energy. And of course interference is because of the superposition of uh, wave functions. Now uh, quantum theory is fundamentally correct but uh, uh, we need mostly this theory at the level of single photons. At a high light level, it turns out that the classical theory, the cal classical calculations in most cases yield the correct experimental results. So we do use classical theory at high light level, but at single photon levels, we can only use um, quantum theory. So this, uh, uh, we, this we need to keep in mind that this theory is fundamentally incorrect, but definitely works at high light level. But this theory is fundamentally correct, works at any uh, light level, but we mostly use it at the level of single photons. Uh, this entire thing of superposition and coherence and how it actually behaves within quantum theory can very nicely be summarized by what Dirac said and he says a photon interferes with itself. This is the best explanation one can have, although it doesn't make sense, but it, this is the best exp explanation that we have so far, that a photon interferes with itself. Interference between two different photons never occur. Uh, in fact, when we go to the two particle uh, quantum mechanics, there I will also try to kind of have a very analogous uh, kind of intuition that they will say that a two photon, we will try to explain all the interference effect uh, with the intuition that a two photon interferes with itself. So this is actually a very, uh, very important statement made by Dirac and that's how we explain all the interferences within quantum mechanics. The other thing we saw that was Bohr's complementarity principle and that says that any, any effort to get the which slit information or in other words the particle information, it actually destroys the interference pattern or, or, or the wave information. And to the extent that we get this information, the same degree to the same extent, the other information actually uh, gets destroyed. And that's of course complementarity principle. So just quickly, this is how this is how we understand classical interference. So this is classical source, and this is a slit, double slit, and that's my interference uh, recording screen. I have just put it at different uh, time shots. So if the light is very low intensity, then we see interference pattern pretty faint interference pattern. If the light intensity increases, slightly bright interference pattern, the light intensity increases further, even brighter interference pattern. So qualitatively, there is no difference between the interference patterns with different uh, light intensities or uh, just the different time integration. Uh, it remains the same. On the other hand, in, uh, in quantum mechanics, this is qualitatively different. So if we have the same uh, experiment with single photons, if we collect the photons on the screen for only a few, uh, I mean, very small amount of time, then what, what we get is just the dotted structure. Collected for a uh, little longer, we get more dots connected for fine enough uh, uh, time and then we actually have the same pattern that we actually have in the classical case. So the point is, if we dim the uh, source, if we keep doing it, keep reducing the intensity of the source, classically the interference pattern doesn't change. 
the qualitative behavior in the fitness panel remains the same. It's just the overall intensity, the overall energy uh, of the interference pattern that just decreases. On the other hand, in quantum mechanics, if you look at the interference pattern at very, very uh, high light level of photon levels, then we do see a continuous kind of pattern. But when we decrease it, this continuous pattern actually goes away and then we all we end up with is this dotted structure. So that actually is the difference between classical and quantum uh, interferences. Okay, so with that, let's uh, uh, get to uh, today's lecture and today we are going to uh, introduce coherence. So this, there's just a very few basic statements and basic intuition about coherence that I'm going to present and then we'll uh, later we'll do all this in much more math, with much more mathematical rigor. So uh, when fields, this, this is a genetic understanding we have of coherence, that when fields coming from two different space-time points are perfectly coherent, the interference uh, that results has to be perfect, is perfect. Uh, on the other hand, if the interference is not perfect, then that means that the fields of the two space-time points that we are talking about are only partially coherent. Uh, so just to kind of explain that, let's say this is the uh, uh, this is the light field coming from some source. There is a Young's double slit here. There's two two slits. Of course, light from these two slits are then going to uh, go forward. And here we have a screen. And now we look at what is the intensity pattern that gets formed at this screen. Of course, we know that there should be an interference pattern as a function of this x. And if we see that this interference pattern is almost 100% visibility, very nice visibility, we say that this is highly coherent. That means, and that means the light, uh, uh, well, the, the interference visibility at this point that we see on the screen is basically representative of how much is this light at this point x1 is coherent with the light at this point x2. Okay, so the interference here tells us about the degree of coherence of light between x1 and x2 at this point. So this interference pattern tells us that the light coming from x1 and x2 are highly coherent. But suppose if instead of this, if we see that the interference pattern is like this, of course the total energy is still the same, but these, the, the, the lower points are not going all the way down to zero and the higher points again, the, the, the maxima are not going as high. So then in this case, we say that the light coming from these two uh, slits are mutually partially coherent. Uh, if we see that this variation is even smaller, I mean, in this case is very small, and this is like almost incoherent, nearly in incoherent light. So that is the kind of intuitive understanding we have of coherence, that if the light coming from two different space time points are coherent, they have to produce pretty good, pretty good visibility interference pattern. If the interference pattern doesn't have as, as uh, nice a visibility, that means it is not coherent. Of course, it is almost impossible to get perfectly incoherent light and similarly, it is almost impossible to get perfectly uh, uh, coherent light. It's always in between that uh, we have. Okay, so uh, some more uh, uh, points about coherence. Now, as to uh, when we have partial coherence, when we don't have perfect coherence, what is the, what, what is the cause for that? So the cause for that is that the field produced by real sources are more or less random. And why is that? Uh, that's because a real physical source consists of infinitely many emitters, all of which emit in a statistically independent manner. So for example, if this is a source of emitter, it consists of a lot of, let's say, atoms or molecules that emit uh, light. But and, and all these emitters, if, if this is atom or molecule, they are emitting independently. Uh, when this atom emits versus when this atom emits, there is no correlation either in time or the or in the phases of the uh, field uh, that these uh, atoms produce. So there is simply no correlation between the fields produced by these different atoms. Uh, and as a result, if you look at the fine complete total field that is produced by uh, the source, all these atoms together, and here, here we are talking about you know the Avogadro number of atom in any realistic source. Uh, and again, if all of them are emitting on their own and independently, then of course the the, the field at this point x1 and x2 they will be uh, partially coherent only. They cannot be fully coherent. 
okay so that's the kind of uh, intuitive understanding as to why do we even have partial uh, partial coherence now just bringing both classical and quantum uh, theory and descriptions what we have is that coherence as a requirement for interference actually remains the same in both classical and quantum descriptions uh, that uh, that we'll see in detail but here i'm just kind of putting everything together within quantum theory the concept of coherence can also be cast in terms of indistinguishability arguments uh, this i had uh, uh, th 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 this we had discussed in the last lecture as well but i'll just uh, put it all together so what this uh, what this means is that if a photon in two interfering alternatives uh, remain indistinguishable then two alternatives become mutually coherent and as a result interference uh, takes place so this is the example that we had seen last time that is a laser single photons are uh, photons are coming one by one and we saw that if there was no polarizer if the, th this was a polarizer kept at 45 degree uh, uh, angle if there is no polarizer then we have that the, the photon coming from this side is vertical photon coming from this side is horizontal so if we just look at the photon here and put a polarizer then if you find that it is h then we know for sure that it came this way if we find that it is v then we know for sure that it came this way and hence in that case there is no interference pattern but if you do put a polarizer at 45 degree then whatever photon gets through it has to be 45 degree polarized and of course a horizontally polarized light has 50 percent chance of passing through uh, a polarizer at 50 de uh, 40, uh, 45 degree as well as a vertically polarized photon also has 50 percent chance of passing through a polarizer kept at 45 degree so if we look at the photon here and then find that it is 45 degree polarized then of course we have no way of knowing whether it came this way or that way and since in this case we do not have the we, we have lost the ability of finding out whether the photon came this way or that way that means we have lost the ability to find the which, which path information then since since that information is lost now the interference will actually appear so that is uh, uh, that is the indistinguishability argument you know by which one says one explains interference within quantum mechanics that is also one way of kind of doing it okay uh, uh, some more broader perspective of coherence so coherence in general is is when we study coherence we actually try to quantify the the degree of order in a random field so of course this is uh, all the atoms are emitting randomly so is it completely incoherent no there is some coherence still uh, there and in fact we find that as we uh, move out from the source the in fact the the spatial coherence will actually also increase so so the 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 coherence theory is actually what it does basically uh, uh, quantifies the degree of coherence in a random field now within classical description uh, randomness is in principle removable if complete information about the system becomes available well this is easier said than done but in principle uh, a randomness is actually removed within classical theory but of course since it is very difficult one studies randomness through correlation functions only even within classical uh, uh, description on the other hand in quantum description the randomness is not removable even in principle and and here the only concrete quantity that can be studied is the correlation function as I said, in, within, within classical theory, it is in principle removable, but in quantum mechanics, it is even in principle one cannot remove. But when it comes to random fields, even, even within classical uh, description, we study correlation. We study it through correlation functions only, and same is true in quantum description as well. There can be some class of fields. Uh, the classical, for which the classical and quantum description of coherence yield the same result, but of course, this is not true in general. And one example uh, that we can have here is the, of course, the entangled field. So the, with entangled fields, the experimental uh, results that we see can definitely never be explained uh, in terms of classical theories. But there definitely can be a few fields, certain fields uh, that actually can be explained either using classical coherence theory or quantum coherence theory. Okay. So this was this was just the. Uh, um, basic conceptual description of what coherence is and what coherence theory aims to kind of achieve and, and, and do. And now I'm actually going to uh, go through some essential concepts of uh, stochastic processes that we're going to use um, 
when we study these uh, uh, the the second order coherence uh, in detail. So uh, and I think most of the concept must be familiar with um, with the people taking this course. So the first concept I want to look at is the basics of probability theory. Uh, so what we have here is that in this example we have somebody just throwing a ball into this box, and one wants to find out where actually the box ends up in the uh, uh, where the ball ends up in the box of course it has to be between a and b because that's a hard block so it can't go beyond that so but be between a and b it can actually uh, go anywhere and suppose this is the probability density of this event happening then uh, uh, then uh, let's say px is the probability density that the ball after lying in the box is found at position x uh, then we know that the px dx that dx is the tiny uh, x interval px dx is the probability that the, uh, that the position of the ball is between x and x plus dx uh, the probability that the ball is found between a and b has to be unity because these are the hard blocks and the ball cannot go beyond that so the probability px dx uh, integrated from a to b has to be 1 which basically says that the uh, ball has to be found between a and b and for any other pair of points, uh, let's say A0 and B0, the probability that the ball is found between those pair of points is basically Px dx integrated between A0 and B0. So, uh, that's the basics of probability. Now here, let me just uh, make a comment that uh, within within classical within classical theory, I mean, although this is a random event, but within classical theory, if we knew everything about this ball, if we knew everything about this, uh, you know, hand and temperature and humidity and everything, then in principle, it is possible to predict where exactly the ball is going to land. Uh, however, of course, practically, uh, it is not possible. It is just not possible to have that much of information. But in principle, if we have that much of information, one could actually actually predict as to where the ball will uh, land within the box. But in a quantum uh, setup, in a quantum system, that is not possible. And that's what we mean when we say that the, the uh, uh, randomness within quantum mechanics is even in principle not removable. Okay. Now, the other concept that is very useful uh, and is actually the... Uh, at the core is the concept of ensemble average since it's a random process we cannot find out uh, uh, what happens with the process so all that we uh, can find out is through uh, what's called the ensemble average now what is what what is the concept of ensemble so for a random variable let's say x the collection of its all possible re realizations constitute the ensemble of x so for example in this uh, uh, somebody throwing the ball in the box example let's say in the first experiment the person throws a ball and the ball lands up somewhere here that's called x plus one uh, you do the experiment but th this this experiment done in exactly the same set of environment nothing is changed here but if you throw the ball since it's a random uh, uh, event the ball will land somewhere in the box maybe not definitely not at the uh, same location we keep repeating the experiment infinite number of times and each time the ball you know lands somewhere so these are called the realizations of the random event this this event was done within the exactly same circumstances the conditions but of course the ball lands at different locations because it's random so these these different realizations they are called uh, these these different realizations these constitute the ensemble for that random variable of course, they need not be uh, separated in time. When we talk about ensemble, we actually mean all these realizations to be the simultaneous realization. But of course, in practice, we cannot realize all these realizations at the same time simultaneously. So mostly we will see that the concept of ensemble average becomes useful when we, uh, it becomes actually really useful in, in the context of when we do time average, space average, angle average, and so on. Uh, but but this is this this is the concept of ensemble. These are the all the different realizations of the same same event, uh, and these are supposed to kind of exist uh, simultaneously. Uh, okay, of course, for a random process, individual realizations do not yield meaningful information. 
So the 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 most relevant quantity, the relevant quantity is the ensemble average, and it is actually the average of of a random variable one obtains uh, if the same experiment is repeated over a large number of times. So how do we define the ensemble average? This actually is is done as part of uh, any basic uh, probability. Let me just uh, yeah. So how do we define the ensemble? So here we see that we have all these uh, all these different realizations, and in each realization, the value of value of x is let's say x one, x two, and x i in the ith realization. So the ensemble average is defined as a uh, write it as this is the ensemble this this uh, angular bracket that represent ensemble average and this is defined in the following manner that this is of course limit and going to infinity For the normalization, so this ith, this is the ith realization, uh, and that's uh, and th that's one of these. And uh, we take this ith realization and then sum them over and divide them by uh, the number of realization. Of course, when we say ensemble as we do mean it in the context of n being infinity. Okay, so uh, of course this x is the ith realization in the ensemble, and the uh, uh, we typically define this in the in the in the, in the limit n going to infinity. Okay, so uh, this is this is the definition, and most of the time we don't actually use it because, of course, it's not practical to have these many these many realizations. And quite often we have the we have the probability density, even though we don't have this individual realization, we do have the probability density. And so when we do have the probability density of a random process, then the ensemble average can also be calculated in in in, in this manner. Uh, this is a different way of uh, uh, doing the same thing. So it's it's the th this time it's called the expectation value. We can write it uh, the same manner. That is the uh, curly the angular brackets, and this we define as so. This is the random event x. The probability density is p x. So then we integrate this from whatever is the uh, range of integration here it is from A to B so we integrate this and that gives us the expectation value this is called the expectation value so when when the probability density is known then we can also calculate the expectation value and the expectation value is same as the ensemble average there is no difference And in fact, in this course, uh, uh, the 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 concept ensemble average and the expectation value we will uh, uh, we will use them interchangeably in this course. So uh, uh, so it basically depends on whether the probability density of a random process is given or not. One uses one or the other definition. Okay. So now the the expectation value or the uh, or the ensemble average of x is not the only quantity uh, that we can find about the random process. There can be whole hierarchy of uh, expectation values yielding different levels of information about a random process. So for example here it's x and then we looked at the uh, expectation value of x but there can be, uh, uh, there can be other uh, uh, expectation values and for example what what is defined is what's called the rth order moment of a random process the rth order moment of a random process is defined in this manner let me just use a different color blue so we we have defined we have just now defined the uh, um, 
the expectation value of x but let me just let's just do x r so now we this is the expectation value of x to the r and that's called the rth order moment of a random process uh, and this is defined i mean we can guess how is this the, the definition of expectation value remains the same so this is just x r So this is the uh, this is XR. So this is the Rth order moment, and uh, uh, and this this yields a lot of uh, other information that the expectation value of X does not. And this we will see uh, uh, throughout this course. The of course the first moment the X that is called the mean. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, it is also a practice actually quite useful to define the higher order moments, this Rth order moment, and so on around the mean and in that case uh, these uh, these are called the uh, central moments so the rth central order moment we can define as uh, you know, uh, is the same definition almost the same definition just that we we have to define it uh, uh, around mean so that means we just subtract it from the mean so if x minus mean of x so that becomes the quantity and if you want the rth order moment of this one so this quantity times rth and the expectation value of this so of course this is defined in very analogous manner the definition remains the same so now it's like x minus mean x it is to the R dx dx. Okay, so this is the this is the definition of the central moment. This is the definition definition of the central moment, and of course the uh, first central moment is always zero because we are subtracting the mean so of course the first moment has to be zero the second central moment is actually called the variance this we are all familiar with and the square root of this variance is called the standard deviation so that's under root x minus mean x that's whole square that's the second uh, central moment and that is the square root of that is the standard deviation as it is it is the variance also uh, one fact without I, 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 without proving it if the probability density is a Gaussian function, if Px is a Gaussian function, then it turns out all the higher order moments can be expressed in terms of the first two central moments. Uh, however, this is of course not the case for a general probability density, but this is a very special uh, property of the Gaussian function. So uh, this we just keep in mind. Now, uh, the uh, uh, the 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 moment of a process is not the only uh, uh, the moments of a process is not the only useful information one can extract from the random process. Uh, we can actually have uh, in many physical situations we can actually have uh, more than one random variables, and in that case one uses joint probability because one might be interested as to what is the joint probability of this event and that event happening together. So joint probability is the probability that the, that the two events uh, two events happen together. So let's say let's take an example that let's say x, x1 and x2 be two random variables, and p x1 x2 be the joint probability intensity. Of course, how we find it that depends on the details of the uh, experiment and situation. But let's say x1 x2 are two random variables, and p x1 x2 is the joint probability density. This that means uh, this is the probability density that both the events happen uh, together. Uh, and also suppose that P1 X1 and P2 X2, these are the probability densities uh, corresponding to random variables X1 and X2. Then the probability density 
for individual random processes that means p1 x1 p2 x2 the act actually one can obtain these from the joint probability by integrating over the other random variable uh, what we mean is the following this act, of course i think everybody is kind of familiar but i'm just kind of uh, you know, bringing it again in the beginning of the course because we will use these seemingly simple concepts the same concept will actually uh, extend when we study the higher order correlation function and then then it will be joint probability of you know four or different events and that's how we go towards the multiparticle correlation but the basic concept actually remains the same that's why we are kind of summarizing this in detail and the, actually the mathematical structure will also remain very analogous so if the joint probability is given how do you find out the individual probability well it is uh, very simple so p 1 x 1 this we can find out if we have p the joint probability and the joint probability here is p x 1 x2 so how do we find the uh, this p x p1 x1 well just uh, just integrate this probability over the other variable tx2 this will give us the uh, the probability for x1 similarly if we just do p2 x2 all we need integrate this joint probability density x1 x2 over dx1 and that's it so now if if x1 x2 are completely uncorrelated uh, for example there can be there can be uh, uh, physical situation where these two are completely uncorrelated uh, uh, random events and in that case the probability density is p1 x1 x2 actually factorizes as px1 px2 uh, so this is a, a simple fact now if here what we have discussed is just the uh, continuous random variable x1 x2 but if there is a you know, for discrete variables the concept remains pretty much the same so suppose xi and yj are the two uh, discrete random variables with probabilities pxi and pyj uh, uh, and, and if p x i y j uh, is the joint probability then p x i that the probability that the x i happens that that is basically p x i y j that is the joint probability of x i with all the y j and then we sum over so sum it over j so uh, uh, this gives us p x i similarly the probability of even y j happening is the sum of the joint probabilities of yj with all the xi's uh, and that's the so it's a basically same concept here is the integral here is the summation and the, the, these 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 concepts we, we are actually going to use in a, in in an analogous manner when we actually go to the two particle uh, uh, quantum interference effects okay so right so yeah the, these concepts will study for the two photon entangled fields uh, the one more this the extension of this joint probability uh, well we, we, with the joint probability we actually uh, define what's called correlation function so for more than one random variable one generalizes this concept of moments to what's called the correlation function uh, for in fact uh, the very simplest correlation function that one can construct uh, out of two uh, random variables is the following we have seen if, if these are the individual random events then of course we can have the uh, we can have the moments of x1 rth moment or, or, or the central moment but again when if, if there are two random uh, variables then the simplest object we can define is the expectation value of x1 times x2 that's the simplest that we can define so that's the expectation value and how do we define it well the definition is again uh, analogous just x1 x2 joint probability p x1 
x2 dx1 dx2 so this is the this is the simplest object simplest expectation value one can define when there are two random uh, two random variables of course if p x if x1 is equal to x2 but if we could i mean if, if they are the same uh, uh, event then of course x1 x2 becomes the second moment of random variable x2 so x1 x2 indeed contains more information than just x1 or x2 so this is a different object than just multiplying x1 and x2 so that's the main point now of course this is the, this is just the simplest and of course we can have a whole hierarchy of correlation function uh, that one can define with these two random variables uh, here i'm putting a very generic one this is the this is x1 to the m x2 to x2 to the n and that's the uh, that's the expectation value or the correlation function and this is the correlation function with mth moment of x1 and nth moment of x2 of course then uh, um, we, we started with the simple uh, simple expectation value of x1 and i said uh, that simple concept we can generalize to the product of x1 and x2 and that's how it is uh, uh, defined but of course now these individual uh, random variables x1 and x2 they might also uh, they can actually depend on time and in fact if we uh, add those time arguments then these definitions can be even more general and in that case we can have x1 t1 x2 t2 and the expectation value of that uh, this is actually called the two time correlation function of random variables x1 t and x2 t okay so so far we have discussed the random variables that are mostly real and of course in classical mechanics we mostly deal with real variables but even within classical mechanics uh, we use uh, complex variables that's pretty much for the mathematical ease but we do use complex variables but when it comes to quantum mechanics the we have to use complex variables only because wave functions are complex and real numbers the real functions cannot capture everything quantum so so one has to have uh, that so of course a general uh, uh, random variable in general is complex within the uh, classical theory it is optional but we do use it for the uh, ease of calculation uh, in 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 quantum theory one has to have uh, complex variables so but the but the the idea of uh, uh, correlation function remains the same so let's say now if the z1 and z2 are two complex random variables then the two time correlation function that we define we define it in this manner z1 star t1 z2 star t2 so this definition remains precisely the same except that this case we are adding a z star um, now one can also uh, one can also ask uh, when when it's a complex variable and why are we choosing just z1 star and z2 why not the other combination for example z1 z2 or z1 star z2 star uh, this we will discuss little more detail but these other quantities i mean i'm just making comment here these other quantities uh, do not yield meaningful uh, quantity and in fact this is the, the this is this is the meaningful quantity in 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 physical situation and that's why we uh, take it again as in the other case a whole hierarchy of such correlation function can be defined for complex random variables as well as we have done it for real random variables so for example we have this z1 star t1 z2 star t2 up to zn star tn these are the complex quantity and then zn1 tn1 z n plus 2 t n plus 2 up to z 2 n t 2 n so at least in this course i mean uh, we will only consider correlation function with equal number of complex and complex conjugate uh, quantities uh, but uh, uh, the the definition actually uh, all i'm trying to point out the definition remains same this this we started with the simple moment x1 then we go to x1 x2 then we come to uh, x1 t1 x2 t2 then we come to the complex uh, random variable in which case the only difference is that we have to put in a star here and not the other combination and then of course we can have a, a whole hierarchy of such correlation function the the two time correlation function this one the two time correlation function uh, is called the mutual correlation function and when z1 is uh, uh, e z1 and z2 are equal the correlation function is referred to as the autocorrelation function so so this is where we will stop uh, today